8 o'clock and we'll get started. This is a, a special Grand Rounds because it's our last Grand Rounds for the season. Um, and we will be taking a summer break uh, and restarting in September. And the goal for September is a hybrid format with in-person Grand Rounds um, with the availability of live streaming. So um, today to introduce our um, final speaker of the year is Dr. Michael Lucy. Thank you very much, Lynn. And it is a real pleasure and a privilege to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Rita German, who is going to be our speaker for today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rita. Um, she was born in Belarus in a city called Bab Babruske and came to the United States in 1992. Uh, she uh, received her undergraduate education at Northwestern University, uh, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and Psychology in 2007. And then she was, uh, did her medical degree at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine, uh, graduating in 2012. She then did her medical internship and medical residency at the University of Chicago, and in 2015, we were fortunate enough to recruit her to our GI fellowship. And she was a GI fellow until 2018. And from 2018 and 2019, she uh, did an additional fellowship in transplant hepatology here at the University of Wisconsin. And then she joined our faculty in 2019 as a, an assistant professor of medicine in the division. Now, Rita is a very accomplished person. Um, uh, she has several undergraduate awards. I won't list them out, but there are several. Uh, but just looking at her uh, um, uh, college and post-college career, she was elected to Alpha Omega Alpha in, in uh, our medical school. Uh, she has been prominent in the American Association for Study of Liver Diseases, where she was uh, awarded the title of Emerging Liver Scholar and then a fellow ambassador. Uh, 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 she uh, received uh, a, a, a travel grant for the American Transplant Congress from the American Society of Transplantation in 2019 for, uh, uh, to present an abstract. And in 2018, she was selected uh, by the fellows and faculty in our division as for the Fellowship Professionalism Award. Um, uh, Rita has also been a prolific uh, a writer, um, and her CV uh, lists 10 publications in peer-reviewed um, uh, um, uh, journals, uh, six of which are uh, since she was a fellow and now as a faculty member. Uh, in, uh, and they all focus on aspects uh, in the recent years in aspects of liver disease, um, uh, uh, which is where she is making her career. Um, she has now set up uh, an innovative multi, a multidisciplinary approach to the care of patients with alcohol associated liver disease, which she's going to tell us about today. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Rita German. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a very lovely introduction uh, and great job on pronouncing Bobroisk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as Michael, as Dr. Lucy mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about optimizing care for patients with alcohol associated liver disease. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, I will be talking about this multidisciplinary clinic that we are going to be setting up. There we go. I have no financial disclosures. So by the end of this talk, I hope that we can all learn to describe recent trends in mortality associated with alcohol use disorder and alcohol associated liver disease, explain current and future therapeutic targets for the treatment of alcoholic hepatitis, discuss the importance of incorporating treatment for alcohol use disorder into the treatment for alcohol associated liver disease in a multidisciplinary integrated fashion, and recognize the need oops, recognize the need for education regarding management of alcohol use disorder to medical providers at all levels of training and practice. So let's talk about a, a day in the recent life of a hepatologist. So I think when most of us think about cirrhosis, we think about someone in their 60s or 70s or even older who has had decompensated cirrhosis and has had cirrhosis that's been brewing for a very long time and now it's come to uh, clinical life. But lately, more and more, what we've been seeing is that the people we're seeing in the hospital and the people we're seeing in our clinics 
dying of alcohol associated liver disease or liver disease in general are those in their 30s and 40s and even late 20s. And it's kind of a terrifying sight to see. And I experienced this, experienced this uh, all throughout fellowship, but then firsthand as an attending, my first week on service, we had a really tough week of seeing these kind of patients. And I just want to discuss a few of them here real quick, just to give you a sense of what we're seeing um, happening on the inpatient service. So the first patient, one of our patients, this is among the rest of the patients that we saw that week was a 36 year old male with alcoholic hepatitis, a meld of 38, severe alcohol use disorder, several attempts to quit in the past, but unsuccessful and doesn't want counseling as he feels like alcohol isn't his issue. There was another uh, patient, a 34 year old female who had alcoholic hepatitis, also meld of 39, severe alcohol use disorder, not forthcoming with alcohol use. And then a 31 year old female with alcohol hepatitis, severe alcohol use disorder. She quit a month ago, a history of trauma leading to depression and self-medication with alcohol and wants to see counseling. And this was not a unique week. This is what we're seeing more and more. And this is just very common now. And uh, I think that some of us have gotten used to it, but the fact that this is happening is really still should be kind of shocking to all of us and uh, really sad. And this is not a unique trend that we are seeing here at UW. This is a trend we're seeing nationwide. So this study by Tapper et al. looked at rates of death from alcohol associated liver disease and cirrhosis in general from 2009 to 2016. And what they found was that young adults ages 25 to 34 made up the highest rising rate of cirrhosis related deaths. And it was entirely attributed to alcohol related liver disease and alcohol use disorder. And this is very scary. And there's also in parallel to that, the rising proportion of liver transplants performed for alcohol associated liver disease. So the orange bar is women with alcohol associated liver disease and the blue bar is men with alcohol associated liver disease. And the total is in the blue line. And what you can see is that in 2019, about 39% of liver transplants were performed for a diagnosis of alcohol associated liver disease. Now this rises in uh, two, po two parts of why this is happening. One is the decreasing need for hepatitis C to be transplanted because we have uh, direct acting antiviral agents that now can cure hepatitis C that were invented essentially and came out in about 2014. And also the changing policies for transplantation for alcohol, alcoholic hepatitis has really increased the number of patients we transplant for alcohol associated liver disease. So now what has COVID done to these trends? Obviously we're still technically living within this pandemic. So we wanna talk about kind of what we've seen in the last year. Well, honestly, nothing good. <laughs> so alcohol use patterns have changed for the worse, uh, meaning more people are drinking. Uh, so there were several studies that looked at the patterns of drinking. This one specifically by Bochets et al from uh, MCW wanted to look at patterns of drinking pre-social distancing, which is the blue bar, and post-social distancing, which is the gray bar. And so they asked, how often do you drink containing alcohol? This was a survey that was sent out and about 470 people responded. The majority were women. Interestingly, those that never drink, that amount actually increased. So abstinence actually did increase from six to 12.5%. But it's those patients that were already drinking before the pandemic who tended to drink more afterwards. So those drinking more than four times a week significantly increased. Similarly, those that were drinking one to two drinks a day, three to four drinks a day before social distancing, that part didn't really change. But those that were drinking five or six drinks a day, that did increase post social distancing as well. Interestingly, binge drinking or drinking uh, more than four drinks at a time, specifically this question was six or more drinks on one occasion, that actually did not increase. So those that saying that they never binge drink actually increased, but then you can see here that still people that were drinking heavily weekly, that did increase. There was another survey of 1,540 adults, 54% were ages 30 to 59 and 57% were female they found a 14% increase in alcohol consumption when, compare, consumption when compared to 2019, and a 17% increase for women compared to prior to the pandemic. And they, this, in contrast to the last uh, survey, actually did see a 41% increase in binge drinking in women, so more than four drinks a day. 
And so they wanted to find out, well, what kind of factors were more likely to lead, what, what patient factors were more likely to lead to excess alcohol consumption during this time? Well, some of those factors that they saw were being older, being female, working from home, more likely to have children, be higher educated, consume alcohol more frequently and in higher quantities, and having a history of substance use, abuse, uh, and higher levels of anxiety and depression. So all of these factors essentially led patients to drink more during the pandemic. And so unfortunately, these patients who have alcohol-associated liver disease during the time of COVID also have an increased risk of severe COVID infection. And that's related to several factors. One is that they're more likely to have increased drinking or relapse. They're you know, on their own, they're not <clears throat> seeking counseling, they're not seeking help and they're isolated. And so they're more likely to drink and relapse. They're also delaying in seeking medical care as were a lot of people. They weren't going to the hospital if, even if they were noticing symptoms. And social isolation played a huge role. Family members weren't there to see them. Hey, you know, you're turning yellow. I think you need to see a, you go to the hospital. These patients were isolated and not seeking care. Psychological decompensation. Those patients with anxiety or depression were self-medicating themselves with alcohol, perpetuating their the cycle of depression and anxiety, and again, making uh, them at increased risk for severe COVID. Depressed immune system in patients with cirrhosis, and finally, that they have high risk underlying comorbidities. So all of these factors really contribute to them getting sicker if they did get COVID. And so it's hard to, um, it also doesn't help that alcohol is kind of pervasive in the news and it's part of the American culture. It's uh, used for celebrations. You know, it's something that we talk about all the time. And so it's something that's not frowned upon necessarily. So we hear things like Tipsy Tuesday and Thirsty Thursday and Rosé all day. I mean, these are, fun little puns that uh, make it okay to drink and seem okay to you know, start drinking first thing in the morning because you're having rosé, so it's not a big deal. Um, so this is a lot of the feedback that people are getting in American society. But the good thing is that the news is also catching up to the fact that this is problematic. And so there was uh, the AHA published something in July, 2020 about how COVID is bringing concerns about excess drinking. NPR had a recent segment in March about off the chart rise in alcohol associated liver disease in young adults. America has a drinking problem from the Atlantic. And then UW Health, we did a uh, message of the day in April as again about talking about how we are seeing also these increasing trends of liver disease and trying to get this message out to the public so they understand, yes, it might be safe to drink in moderation and safe amounts for someone that doesn't have liver disease, but in those that have liver disease, we're seeing some major um, concerning findings here. So we really got to get things like Mocktail Monday and other fun puns off the ground more than Tipsy Tuesday. So based on the things we've discussed so far, we know this problem is not going away. So we know also that all treatment for alcohol-associated liver disease begins with abstaining from alcohol. We have to get better at treating the alcohol use disorder along with treating the liver disease in order for this to get better. And so we know that abstinence works. So this, um, this publication by Altamirano et al. looked at whether or not alcohol abstinence actually improved survival after an episode of alcohol hepatitis. And this is a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at uh, that result. So you can see that complete abstinence, those that had a complete abstinence did have improved survival compared to those that were drinking afterwards. So we know that alcohol abstinence works. It can improve survival after alcohol hepatitis. They also wanted to find out, well, what factors can predict those that are gonna abstain or go back to drinking? So we'll go through this in closer detail. They identified two groups. One was the high rate abstinence group, those more likely to abstain from alcohol. So 65% abstinence uh, rate. Those patients were ones that did not have prior alcohol treatment and were above the age of 48. In contrast, the ones that had a low rate abstinence group, those that were only able to stay abstinent about 26% of the time, those patients were ones that had prior alcohol treatment or if they didn't have alcohol treatment, they were below 48 years old. So essentially they identified that age over 48 and lack of past alcohol use treatment predicted alcohol abstinence. 
And so here I just want to demonstrate that there's a progression here from the normal liver to fat in the liver to cirrhosis, excuse me, and then HCC. And alcoholic hepatitis is its own entity. The majority of patients with alcoholic hepatitis do have underlying cirrhosis, but with abstinence, if you follow these green arrows, they can reverse to steatosis and even to a normal liver. So it is possible to reverse this process. The majority, however, will have underlying scar tissue, but this is just to point out that we have to ensure that these patients remain abstinent. That's really the only way that they will survive going forward. So let's just define this a little bit. So this is a clinical syndrome defined by jaundice of recent onset, a systemic inflammatory reaction, and recent heavy alcohol use. Typically, when we talk about alcohol hepatitis and treatment for it, we talk about what's called severe alcohol hepatitis, and that's what treatment is targeted towards. It's those that have a MADRI's discriminant function above 32 and a BEL MELD score above 21. And the MADRI score is a score that we use to identify patients who would benefit from steroid therapy. So it's a score that takes into account the bilirubin and the prothrombin time and put together, it comes up with a score. And if it's above 32, that makes us more likely to recommend steroid therapy. And the reason why this is severe alcohol hepatitis is because the mortality rate is exceedingly high, 20 to 50% at 28 days. But what we also know is that non-severe alcohol hepatitis, recent studies have shown that this too has a mortality rate that is not insignificant. And those are patients that have a MADRI's less than 32 or a MELD less than 21. Their mortality rate is still 6% at 28 days. And that doubles at one year to 13%. That doubling rate we think is probably related to just a return to drinking that increases their mortality. So what we're trying to say here is that we need better treatment targets to target the whole spectrum of alcohol hepatitis so that we have better treatment options to treat all patients. And so part of the problem with finding treatment for alcohol hepatitis and alcohol associated liver disease is the definition of it. It has not been clearly defined in the past in research studies. And so it's hard to have a uniform definition and make sure that these studies are actually proving that this is a treatment for alcohol hepatitis. Is it truly alcohol hepatitis? So the NIAAA, which is the National Institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism in 2016 tried to come up with these guidelines of how we can de define alcohol hepatitis and then the ASLD published these guidelines in 2019. So they defined definite alcohol hepatitis as those clinically diagnosed and biopsy proven, those with probable AH that are clinically diagnosed with po without confounding factors and possible AH is clinically diagnosed with possible confounding factors. And those are the ones that may benefit from a liver biopsy. So hopefully this helps us standardize the definition for AH to then facilitate more research studies to, to find more treatment options for these patients. <clears throat> so I've already mentioned that we've kind of made little progress in the treatment for alcohol hepatitis. And again, there's these difficulties in conducting controlled trials. So we already talked about the standardized definition. We don't really have a good working animal model to test these medications on. And the other big thing is that most treatments are now studied alongside corticosteroids. Because we know steroids work, at least we've seen it in many studies, and we'll talk about a few coming up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most research studies are now using whatever other agent in conjunction with corticosteroids. So it's hard to tease out what actually is making bringing that effect. So really apart from steroids, liver transplant and possibly steroids and N-acetylcysteine, we've really made little progress in these novel treatments. So I mentioned that we would talk a little bit about steroid therapy. So the STAPA trial, which was first published in 2015, looked at steroids for the treatment of alcohol hepatitis and pentoxifiline. And what they found was that, yes, corticosteroids do improve survival at 28 days but they do not improve survival by three months, six months, or one year. <clears throat> then a multi, uh, a, another study in 2018 by Louvet et al. looked at a meta-analysis of 11 randomized controlled trials, and they found that yes, corticosteroids again do improve <clears throat> mortality at 28 days compared to control, as we can see in this graph. But again, there was no difference in mortality at six months and there was no benefit in pentoxifiline. 
<clears throat> so corticosteroids really are at best a short-term fix for these patients. And we have to find more longer term fixes for these patients at three, six months and one year so that these patients can survive longer. And a lot of times medications don't work that far because people go back to drinking. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we also wanna identify those patients that may improve on their own. We don't wanna give steroids to everybody. We wanna figure out, well, who's likely to recover on their own and maybe we don't need to give steroids to them. Well, this study was really interesting that they looked at the trajectory of someone's bilirubin in the first seven days of hospitalization to see, are they likely to recover or are they not gonna recover without steroids? They had a group called the fast fallers, those that had a fast falling bilirubin. Those that were in the static group essentially had a bilirubin that was unchanged and the rapid risers that had a bilirubin that climbed within the first seven days. And they found that these fast fallers were more likely to survive at 90 days without medication. And interestingly, benefits didn't help, the, uh, I'm sorry, interestingly, steroids didn't help them. So even in severe disease, you can see here that at 20, <clears throat> 28 days, if they got steroids, if they didn't get steroids, even at 90 days, steroids didn't help. So you don't wanna give steroids to patients that wouldn't benefit from them because there are risks from steroids, of course. There's risk of infection, raising their blood sugars, things like that. So if they, we can identify those that are likely to recover on their own, we'd like to do that without giving them steroids. So now, thanks to a better understanding of the pathophysiology of alcohol hepatitis, we do have a lot of therapeutic targets that are being studied currently and a lot of products that are on the way and currently being stu tried, uh, studied in clinical trials. So the first <clears throat> target is the gut liver access. The next one is the anti-inflammatory agents, antioxidants, and regenerative agents. And in each of these categories, there's lots of other medications that are being studied, but particularly there's fecal microbiota transplant that's being looked at, hyperimmune bovine colostrum for anti-inflammatory agents. There's ones called anakinra and canakinumab. Antioxidants, N-acetylcysteine, we talked a little bit about this, but there was a study that looked and saw that N-acetylcysteine in conjunction with steroids did improve survival. So that's a possibility, but we need more studies. And then for regenerative agents, things like GCSF and IL-22. And a lot of these studies, uh, many of them are coming from India actually, and they have a lot of ongoing trials right now. <clears throat> so the pathophysiology for alcohol hepatitis is complex, but I wanna take you through a little bit of it just so we understand why is it that these are the studies these are the targets that are being targeted. So first, alcohol has lots of different effects on the body. The first thing is that it causes intestinal dysbiosis, which leads to bacterial translocation due to increased intestinal permeability and release of bacterial LPS, translocation of bacterial LPS that travels to the liver and causes this inflammatory signaling to occur. And that's why we have these medications targeting the gut liver access. Secondly, alcohol causes a direct toxic effect to the liver through acetaldehyde and causes oxidative stress. And that's why we have antioxidants that are being studied. And then once these effects occur, there's a huge storm of cytokine release, IL-1 pro-inflammatory cytokines that are released that recruit neutrophils and, and other inflammatory cells. They recruit hepatic stellate cells that lay down the scar tissue in the liver and they recruit endothelial cells that actually contribute to the portal hypertension we see in these patients with development of ascites and variceal bleeds. And that's why we're, being, we're targeting things like anti-inflammatory agents and regenerative agents. <clears throat> so it's a complicated pathophysiology, but now that we know more about it, we can actually target these agents <clears throat> and find things that work. So now we get to, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that we don't have great treatment options for these patients, especially long-term. These patients have a really high mortality rate at 28 days and, and going and on and onward. So is liver transplant an option for alcohol hepatitis? Well, I'll frequently, you know, commonly hear from students, from residents, from other faculty and friends and family that I talk to about this. They're like, well, this patient was drinking right up until admission. How are you transplanting them? Why are we transplanting them? Well, <clears throat> I'll give you a little bit of data about why we are translating patients with alcohol hepatitis here. 
So there was a study um, called the Accelerate trial that UW was actually a part of. There was 12 centers in this. And since the study, there have been many others as well. This was published in 2018. And they looked at the outcomes of early liver transplantation, meaning those <clears throat> that did not have six months of sobriety to see what the outcome was for patients with alcohol hepatitis. And what they found was that outcomes were really good. So survival rate was comparable to other etiologies of liver disease. So at one year, survival was 94%, and at three years, it was 84%. And while yes, some patients did go back to drinking, sustained alcohol use was actually quite uncommon, 10% at one year and 17% at three year. And the way they defined sustained alcohol use was alcohol use that was occurring for more than 100 days and after the last follow-up. So that's how they defined sustained alcohol use. They did have also uh, definitions for a slip and that was more common, but sustained use was not that common. And so those patients had great survival, but mortality without a transplant is up to 70% at six months. So these patients are really dying from this disease at six months and they can't reach six months to stay sober that long. So if we try to use this arbitrary six month sobriety rule, we know that that <clears throat> number one does not predict sustained sobriety. It doesn't guarantee that somebody isn't going to drink after liver transplant just because they were sober six months beforehand. And many of these people will die before that time period occurs. And so that six month arbitrary rule, we don't use that here because it can exclude a lot of other potentially great candidates that are likely to do well after transplant and survive. And so we want to be able to give them that opportunity. But obviously, we have to figure out which patients are likely to do well. But we know at least that the selective use of liver transplantation for these patients, those patients do have good outcomes. <clears throat> so of course we wanna know what are the risk factors that will lead to recurrent alcohol use after liver transplantation. Lots of studies have looked at this too. And some of the risk factors that have been identified that are likely to predict alcohol use afterwards is a shorter length of sobriety before a liver transplant, patients that have psychiatric comorbidities, multiple failed treatment attempts at quitting drinking or going to alcohol counseling, drinking despite consequences, whether that's medical consequences, legal consequences like having a DUI or personal consequences like getting divorced from because of their alcohol use or losing a job, poor social support. Do they have anybody to live with? Do they have somebody that can take them to and from appointments? no participation in rehab or counseling, and illicit drug use. So all of these factors can sort of predict recurrent alcohol use. So here at UW, we use something called the SIPAT score, the Stanford Integrated Psychosocial Assessment for Transplant. And with this is a tool that not necessarily predicts relapse after transplant, but can predict those that are at high risk for things like rejection or poor adherence to medication or hospitalization rates. And there, there's four domains that we look at <clears throat> that based on the score, we can figure out if they're low, moderate, or high risk to doing well after transplant. So the first domain is readiness. Do they understand their illness? Do they understand the transplant process? Are they willing to adhere to treatment? And <clears throat> what has their treatment adherence been like in the past? So have they left AMA a bunch of times from the hospital? Do they actually take their medications? Do they follow through with recommendations? Those are all important things to find out. Do they have social support? Do they have somebody, again, to drive them back and forth? Are they homeless? Do they have a stable house, housing situation? Of course, we look at their substance use, their alcohol use disorder, their substance use disorder, their risk for relapse, nicotine use, et cetera. <clears throat> and then their psychosocial stability. So looking at psychiatric disease, neurocognitive impairment, do they have personality disorders? Do they have deceptive behaviors? So all of this is typically, this is a 45 minute interview, about 45 minutes that one of our social workers will do. And it's a very helpful tool to help us try to objectify, objectify the process so that we can figure out, well, who is likely to do well after transplant? The SALT score is another score that was developed to try to predict this as well. And this came from the Accelerate data. And this is the called the sustained alcohol use post-liver transplant score. They found that four risk factors were likely to predict relapsed alcohol use post-transplant. The first was drinking more than 10 drinks a day at hospitalization, having multiple prior rehabilitation attempts, prior alcohol-related legal issues, and prior illicit substance use. 
So this is a score from zero to 11. A score over five had a 25% positive predictive rate of predicting who would go back to trans, uh, who would go back to drinking. But it also a score less than five had a 95% negative predictive value of predicting who was likely to abstain. So while this can't really predict who's more likely to go back to drinking, it might be able to tell us who is unlikely to go back to drinking. So if they don't have these risk factors, they are likely to stay sober after transplant. So another useful tool for us to try to use in order to predict who is likely to do well after transplant. And so again, to reiterate, you know, we've talked about that patients will relapse. We know that will happen. Patients will probably drink before transplant and after transplant. So we still have to get better at treating the alcohol use disorder in addition to the liver disease. Transplant doesn't fix the alcohol use disorder. So alcohol absence remains the most important factor from sur in survival for, this pa for these patients. And of course, there's broad agreement on the importance of actually incorporating treatment for alcohol use disorder into the treatment for alcohol-associated liver disease. The care of these two disorders has been siloed in the past to the hepatology clinic for the treatment of alcohol-associated liver disease and addiction medicine, family medicine, psychiatry for the, addiction, for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. And those two usually do not communicate. And most of the time, what actually happens is people get treatment for their liver disease, but the majority don't get treated for their alcohol use disorder. And so they continue to drink, thus perpetuating the cycle and getting worse and worse. So there's a lot of pitfalls in why this is happening and why the management of alcohol use disorder isn't really happening in these patients. The first of which is a lack of early recognition of hazardous drinking. Many of these patients, most of these patients have seen, have been in contact with the healthcare system at some point where they've seen providers that the opportunity has been missed to screen for alcohol use disorder, whether it's in the emergency room or primary care physician or in the GI hepatology clinic. So that's the first problem. The second pitfall is that there's a lack of referral for patients identified with alcohol use disorder to addiction specialist and cognitive behavioral therapy. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And the last is that there's an utter underutilization of alcohol use disorder pharmacotherapy related to lack of training and experience. So we'll go through each of these one by one. So the first thing is recognition. So ESPERT is a method of identifying patients who do have an alcohol or other substance use disorder by screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. So the screening process is assessing the severity of their substance use, identifying the appropriate level of treatment. Brief intervention means increasing the patient's insight and awareness regarding substance use and motivating toward motivation towards behavioral change. And referral to treatment is providing those identified, identified as needing more extensive treatment with the access to specialty care. And this is a brief five to 10 minute intervention that can really help patients and identify patients. And this can be done by anybody in the emergency room, in the primary care clinic, in the GI hepatology clinic. And this is something that's actually on uh, in within Epic that can be done. And so I found this little pocket card that's really helpful that people can print out and keep in their pockets in case they do need to use this to have a brief, you know, quick little assessment. So Again, it uses the audit score, which is the alcohol assessment score to assess their risk level. They try to talk about the pros and cons with the patient and assess their readiness for change. And once you assess what risk level they are, whether they're low, moderate, or high risk, you can try to do a brief intervention where you raise the subject, you assess their uh, readiness for, you know, to try to get help and treatment, and then you refer them to treatment. And these two websites are really helpful because they, the patients can go to these websites and input their zip code and find people that are there to help them in counseling uh, capability for them to, to get involved in. And so these websites I try to give to most of my patients to tr for them to try to also find resources in their zip code that are near them. The second thing is the lack of referral for patients with alcohol use disorder to addiction specialists. And so two recent surveys found that while people are, while GI and hepatology providers are likely to screen for alcohol use disorder, the majority actually do not refer to addiction specialists or cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's unfortunate because within a year of diagnosis of someone's alcohol use disorder, 
only 10% actually receive treatment for that alcohol use disorder. So we have to do better. And we know that integrated therapy does increase rates of abstinence. So this systematic review of 13 studies and almost 2000 patients tried to assess what interventions induce or maintain alcohol abstinence. And essentially they found that really only integrated therapy and comprehensive medical care increase rates of abstinence. They didn't find a single social, psychosocial intervention, a specific one that maintained abstinence, but just that integrated care did pursue, produce smaller rates of recidivism. So that drove the ASA, ASLD, which is our governing body, the liver governing body that creates the guidelines to create this guidance on alcohol associated liver disease to say that referral to treatment for professionals for alcohol use disorder is recommended to ensure that these patients have access to the full range of treatment options and that multidisciplinary integrated management is recommended and improves abstinence rates. So how are we making a difference here in the treatment of these patients at UW? Well, as Dr. Lucy mentioned, we are creating a multidisciplinary clinic just for that purpose. So the website is uh, already done. So this is happening, which is very exciting. It's coming hopefully August 1st. Uh, and it's going to be the alcohol related liver disease and alcohol use disorder clinic over at the digestive health center. And this is a collaborative progress process that uh, I'm working with a lot of other providers to try to make this happen and to provide the best care for our patients and really the standard of care for our patients at this point. So for the care of the patient, we're going to have hepatology, which will be de delivered by myself and Nora Hill, one of our PAs. We're going to have addiction medicine with us with Dr. Randy Brown and Susan Mindock. We're gonna have social work assistance with us to connect patients with care uh, in and around the community. We're gonna have pharmacy help from the DHC to try to prescribe more patients pharmacotherapy to help them to quit alcohol use. And we're gonna of course have nursing care to help us educate patients, give them a giant binder that we're gonna provide for these patients to educate them and, and keep them involved uh, and, and helping the administer some of the surveys that we're gonna to give to patients as well. And then we'd like to collaborate with health psychology over at the DHC as well. And again, we're also collaborating with the University of Michigan. So if some of you remember, Dr. Jessica Mellinger actually was here about two years ago, giving a talk about how she has created a multidisciplinary clinic over at University of Michigan. And really this is, these are one of the first of its kind in the nation. There are not many places that are doing such multidisciplinary clinic due to a multitude of factors. There's a lot of factors you run up against in cure, including uh, insurance payers, including finding the right staff to run these clinic, including motivated people to want to do this. And so Dr. Mellinger had presented her findings here. So we are working closely with her to try to avoid some of the pitfalls that they found in their clinic and to make this a successful endeavor. And so the goal of the clinic will be to provide and connect patients with resources for alcohol counseling and pharmacotherapy for alcohol cessation connect patients with mental health counseling resources, of course, optimize their management of complications of cirrhosis and improve their quality of life. So who's gonna be in our clinic? Well, the referral criteria for our clinic will be those with alcohol-associated liver disease or acute alcohol hepatitis, otherwise not eligible for liver transplant, those that have been actively drinking within the last six months, and those that are willing to speak with addiction medicine providers. And our goal is to enroll over a hundred new patients in the first year. And the reason we are targeting patients with more advanced liver disease and alcohol hepatitis are those that really need the hepatology care immediately so they don't die. And maybe those that may be able to do, uh, qualify for a liver transplant in the future. <clears throat> so just to give a little bit of the results from the Michigan clinic called the Maine clinic, uh, Dr. Mellinger has now published the one year results they had 89 patients that were referred to their clinic. 51 were seen, new patients were seen in the first year and 38 remained active in the clinic. Of those that were new seen in the clinic, four actually got referred to transplant clinic, four of them died, and then several of them were discharged from the clinic because they actually didn't wanna to talk to alcohol provider, uh, medication, alcohol addiction providers. 55% were women, 88% were white, 49% had alcohol-related hepatitis, and 71% had decompensated cirrhosis with a mean, mean meld of 14. Not surprising, 
80% had severe alcohol use disorder, while 84% had at least one comorbid psychiatric or substance use disorder. So many of these patients have more than one issue going on, which is why addiction medicine, family medicine, psychiatry, psychology, all of that is so helpful in this clinic. And Dr. Mellinger's clinic is set up a little bit differently where instead of addiction medicine, they have a psychiatrist as well as an addiction psychologist in their clinic. Interestingly, they looked at pre-treatment, uh, pre-initiation in the clinic and post-initiation in the clinic and what type of treatment people chose. So I'll just point out here. So the light gray bar is what people chose in the past. So only 20% chose one-on-one -on -one treatment before being involved in the clinic. And after being involved in the clinic, 63% chose one-on-one -on -one counseling. As opposed to previously, most patients had chosen AA before being involved in the clinic. And afterwards, only 10% chose AA. And I think part of this is demonstrating that a lot of the patients don't even know what is out there, don't know what options they have. And the only thing they've heard of is AA, but then they get involved in this clinic and they're, they find all of these other options that may be a better fit for them to do one-on-one -on -one counseling as opposed to group therapy. So it's really a wonderful uh, capability for them to do this. Also, they looked at patients on relapse prevention medication. So 14 patients were on it before the initial visit. And after the initial visit, 29 patients were prescribed al alcohol relapse medications, those being naltrexone, acamprosate, and gabapentin. And the, they found that the MELT score at six months improved from 14 to 11. There with, that was statistically significant and also hospital utilization significantly declined when comparing six months before to six months after the initial visit. So this clinic is clearly showing that integrated management, multidisciplinary care does work and improves these outcomes. So that's why we're so excited to get our clinic off the ground to be able to provide this care for patients and really see hopefully good outcomes. And of course, while patient care is our number one priority, we do wanna assess how the clinic is gonna do. We wanna assess the outcomes from this clinic and find out, are we actually doing what we set out to do? And so we are actually gonna be doing a, a multidisciplinary step, prospective study with Michigan and actually Rush, who is also working to set up a multidisciplinary clinic like this, to then look at our clinics and see prospectively enroll and follow these patients and determine outcomes in four domains. That being alcohol use, liver health, mental health, and clinic value. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a, in a second. And our intervention inclusion criteria will be essentially all those, the exact same criteria for those being enrolled into our clinic in the first place. And the control population will be likely those with alcohol associated cirrhosis or acute alcohol hepatitis in the general hepatology or the primary care clinic. And again, we're gonna look at these four domains. So for alcohol use, we're gonna look at alcohol biomarkers. So the PETH test is a test that can tell us if someone has been, it's a blood test that shows if somebody's been drinking in the last three or four weeks. And the ethyl glucuronide is a urine test that can tell us if someone's been drinking in the last three or four days. We're gonna administer things like the audit score, which is the alcohol uh, use score and the Socrates score, which is the readiness for change score. We're gonna look at drinking patterns. Are they drinking less or have they stopped entirely? Are they relapsing less? Do they, you know, are they experiencing any withdrawal symptoms, things like that. And of course, looking at relapse prevention meds, how are we doing with prescribing those? We're gonna look at their overall liver health. So what's their MELD score? Um, what's their portal hypertension look like? Are they having less ascites? Do they need less paracentesis overall? Do they need less diuretics? Is their encephalopathy better? Are they not having variceal bleeds and so on? We're definitely gonna assess their mental health. So the PHQ-9, PHQ-2, GET7, these are all scores for anxiety and depression, assessing anxiety and depression. And then we're gonna look at other substance use disorders. So the BAM is the brief addiction monitor or the DAST, which is the um, drug abuse screening test. So looking at all of these to assess how are we doing in this clinic? And then of course, looking at someone's quality of life. So there's um, surveys called the SF12, SF36, the quality of life surveys. And then we wanna look at the clinic value. Are we reducing hospitalizations? These patients are very costly to the medical system between getting admitted over and over, long hospital stays, liver transplantation. Are we helping reduce the cost by, by improving these patients' 
alcohol use disorder and then therefore improving their liver disease and reducing hospitalizations and cost. So that's a little bit about the clinic. And now I wanna talk about the underutilization of pharmacotherapy related to lack of training and experience. So unfortunately, while many of us know that pharmacotherapy exists for alcohol use disorder, more than 70% of GI and hepatology providers do not prescribe any pharmacotherapy. And that is mostly due to lack of training and experience, and with, using, experience with using these medications. So there was a recent survey, and there's been several surveys that have found this, that a 2020 survey of GI and hepatology providers looked at 408 patients, or 408 providers that responded to the survey. 91% were physicians or physician trainees, and 80% were practicing in a hospital with a liver transplant center. They found that 39% do not routinely refer those with alcohol use disorder to alcohol um, to behavioral therapy. 71% have never prescribed any pharmacotherapy and 50% lack knowledge about FDA approved alcohol use disorder pharmacotherapy. But the good thing is that 90% desire more formal training. So we need more education. That's what this is telling us is that providers are willing to prescribe these medications. It's just that they don't feel comfortable doing it. So we need to get better at educating ourselves. So we need to educate not just the, the faculty, but every step of the way, trainees from medical students all the way to transplant hepatology fellows and addiction medicine fellows to try to mitigate this education gap. So I was recently involved in writing a paper called Joining the Fight, Enhancing Alcohol Treatment uh, in Education for, in Hepatology and Education in Hepatology. And this was essentially a paper to describe, well, how can we improve the education specifically for transplant hepatology fellows, but also for um, hepatology, education and hepatology in general. So we discussed a few things that fellows can do and other people. There's a lot of immersion programs. So there's a fellow immersion training program in addiction medicine. It's a multi-day at Boston University. There's 40-hour CME programs sponsored, sponsored by the AS, ASM, AM, American Society of Addiction Medicine. There's also several conferences that people can attend. And there's, of course, the Addiction Medicine Fellowship. But these are really time consuming. These are not something that we expect our fellows to be able to do, particularly our trans and hepatology fellows who are on service five months of the year. So we have to find other ways to educate our fellows. So there's been some studies looking at on-site expert training. Does that help improve their knowledge of expert, how to screen for these patients? So there was one that looked at comparing a one-time four to six hour interactive training session versus a one hour lecture. And they found that both groups were equally likely to perform alcohol-related interventions, but the interactive session was preferred by participants. So this is something that can be applied to medical students and to residents and to GI fellows to try to give a little bit of expert training so that they feel comfortable performing this. And again, we can also do an, a clinical elective in addiction medicine. So it's been shown that addiction-focused rotations do improve knowledge regarding medication prescribing, relapse prevention, and history taking. So next year with our Transplant Hepatology Fellowship Fellow, we are going to do a clinical elective in addiction medicine with the help of the Addiction Medicine Service with Dr. Randy Brown and Susan Mindak and everyone in addiction medicine. So our Transplant Hepatology Fellow is going to spend two weeks with addiction medicine, maybe even four, on the inpatient service potentially going to uh, see a shift of for alcohol detox at Tellurian, maybe going to New Start and seeing how outpatient group therapy works or intensive inpatient therapy works. So to try to have this immersive way for our transplant hepatology fellows to get more experience in medication prescribing and addiction medicine and learning how all of that works. And the best thing to do would be to create a curriculum for these for our for our um, fellows by creating what's called an entrustable professional activity called the evaluation and management of alcohol use disorder to be able to assess whether or not we are really educating our fellows. So we would look at medical knowledge. So looking to demonstrate knowledge of the prevalence and patterns of alcohol use, the biology of addiction, pharmacotherapy principles, and looking at modalities for behavioral therapy. Then assessing patient care. Does the fellow demonstrate competence in using standardized instruments, screening and diagnosing alcohol use, performing a physical exam for withdrawal, 
understanding the role of biomarkers, and developing a management plan for these patients. And finally, looking at systems-based practices. Can they demonstrate an awareness of when to refer patients for alcohol use disorder? And can they navigate the components of referring someone to the alcohol use disorder community and figuring out where the resources lie? So all of these will hopefully assist us in educating our fellows. And this, can, this doesn't have to be just for the transcend hepatology fellow, but hopefully giving pushing this more for the GI fellows as well. And finally, should we do something like a transplant combined transplant hepatology and addiction medicine program? So there is a combined GI hepatology program that's a pilot program and now is, is no longer a pilot program. So ACGME has this advancing innovation and residency education proposal where you can propose a pilot program. Now we haven't done this yet, but if we have an interested fellow, this is something that we can definitely consider that maybe this is something that we should make more common because we do see it and it, it is such a prevalent part of our day-to-day -day, uh, activity and something that we treat all the time. So in summary, I hope everyone's gained a little bit more knowledge today on the fact that alcohol use disorder and alcohol-associated liver, liver disease is an ever-increasing burden in the US medical system and it is not going away anytime soon. Abstinence is still the key and most important factor in survival for these patients and treatment options really are limited to steroids and liver transplants, but there are new, thought, new targets that are on the way. And we have to incorporate the treatment of alcohol use disorder into the treatment for alcohol liver disease in a multiple, multidisciplinary fashion. And we need to educate from everyone from all uh, aspects of training and practice so we get better at treating these patients. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Great. Well, thank you for a really wonderful overview um, of uh, the, the state of the art of alcohol liver disease. And um, I'm actually very excited about rolling out the multidisciplinary clinic. Um, so and looking forward to, the, to seeing the impact of it. Uh, and it really is a very patient-centered um, goal. So thank you for that wonderful overview. My question is, well, I have a couple of questions. One, do you have any information in, uh, about the uh, incidence of alcohol use disorders in healthcare providers and the impact of COVID uh, for this? I'm just wondering. I don't, but that is a phenomenal question. And my guess is that it would be much higher related to COVID and the social isolation that has come with it. And I think, you know, we know that healthcare providers are are terrible, make terrible patients. So I think a lot of the time we may not even see it on the surface, but it is definitely happening. And we have to make sure that our providers are also getting the care that they need and they know what resources are also available to them because I think it's something that nobody talks about, but is definitely there. And you know, anxiety and depression and um, the demands of our job make it harder that sometimes people do self-medicate. A lot of times people self-medicate with, with alcohol. And so I think I don't know the specific numbers, but I would anticipate that it is definitely a problematic, uh, definitely a problem and COVID has not made things better. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, my other uh, a couple of questions coming up to the, the Q&A. Um, so one question from, from Drew is about um, uh, the fecal microbiota transplant. Um, and have any trials been done in the space? Uh, yes. And what have the results been? Yes, they've actually been very promising. So there was one trial that was done very recently that was in the US um, on fecal microbiota transplant. I wish I had the exact results here, but it really improved rates of alcohol abstinence. I believe at three months, they didn't look at further alcohol abstinence. So it's hard to say what they found was that yes, it definitely can improve um, treatment of alcoholic hepatitis. And actually, sorry, I said alcohol abstinence because there was actually a trial looking at abstinence for fecal microbiota transplant, but it can improve survival and helps um, decrease the MELD score in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. But we don't know the long term and we don't know do they need more than one fecal transplant? Do, we, do they need to keep getting it to continue to see the results? But it is very promising actually. And so there's several ongoing studies about it and one that's been published so far. I'll try to find it. Maybe I can send it out. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and a great question about advice to hospitalists um, when you're discharging patients for screening um, uh, who are screening positive for alcohol use disorder 
Um, one, how do we screen? How do we improve our screening? And what do we do when they screen positive at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's one thing that we're trying to look at as well is that um, a lot of times these patients may screen positive for alcohol use disorder, but then no one checks their liver enzymes. No one looks to see if they also already have underlying liver disease. So a lot of times we're also missing the fact that they're already showing up with liver disease. So if there's any concern that they might have fat in their liver or hepatic steatosis related to this, we should just be referring them to the hepatology clinic. But if you, if you screen someone positive for alcohol use disorder, you know, what I've been doing in my clinic, while I don't, while we don't have addiction medicine right there, I actually refer to social work. So I send a consult referral to social work and say, can you talk to this person about alcohol counseling resources? And I have had great success with them reaching out to the patients and actually helping them walk them through what things are available to them, what is covered by insurance, where they can go for counseling and what kind of resources they need. And then if they're within the hospital still, then consulting addiction medicine, I mean, they are just phenomenal and they're so helpful and we'll see people and give them resources. And it might be just a one-time thing and they might be able to, you know, at least intervene a little bit. So I think that we got to do something for these patients. We can't just say, all right, go off and, and find some resources for yourself because they won't. Uh, and then they'll just come back. So we really have to try to connect them with something. Let's do one more step by connecting them to addiction medicine or social work consult or something to give them the resources. There's also a really good dot phrase in, um, it's, I think it's dot AODA. And it's, it will literally give you a huge list of resources within Dane County, within kind of the Madison region of New Start and Tellurian and all these options that are available. And then give them those two websites. So those websites from uh, findtreatment.gov and SAMHSA and the NIAAA, and we can hopefully post those too. Yeah, I was going to say it would probably be useful to either put them in the chat or send it out um, afterwards. Um, uh, a question you talked about uh, our increasing use of transplant for acute alcoholic hepatitis. Um, what about the alcoholic cirrhosis um, without hepatitis? Do you still go by the six month abstinence rule or what, how do, what's your approach there? Yeah. So if we're just seeing them in the clinic, we don't, we don't have a six months rule at all. That is out of the window. And, and really most, there are still some uh, centers that are using the six months rule. We don't use it for any stipulations. So um, even for someone who, you know, is being transplanted for, let's say NAFLD or something else, we don't have the six month sobriety rule. Um, but yes, for alcohol cirrhosis, we are definitely transplanting those. And if we're seeing them in the clinic, you know, we're, the, the best thing is that they do have a the longer period of sobriety they have before transplant, the better. But sometimes we just don't have the luxury of time. These patients are gonna die by the time we give them this, this amount of time. So if we say that, yes, this person can be put on our transplant list, then if they you know, remain sober and we, we are able to transplant them, we will go ahead and transplant. But that's where that selection process comes in that unfortunately we don't put everybody on the list that does have alcohol hepatitis, even if they've had six months of sobriety. You know, it, it's a, a very arduous process that we go through and we have lots of pay, lots of providers that give input because uh, it's not an easy decision to just tell a 30 year old, hey, you, you know, we can't put you on the transplant list, you're going to die. And that's the reality. And it's, it's, it's kind of horrible. It's the, probably the worst part of our job. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a question about the role of a nutritionist in the multidisciplinary clinic. Um, related to food education, food insecurity, et cetera. Um, do you anticipate dietitians being involved? I think that's a great thought. We, in for now, it's not gonna be in the initial model, but we do have nutritionists at the Digestive Health Center. So I think it would be really easy to kind of fold them into the model and be able to refer patients to nutritionists. I frequently do because many patients do have underlying NAFLD, or they have obesity as well. They also need to be counseled on a low salt diet. They need to be counseled on high protein diet. So absolutely nutrition is key here. And hopefully eventually we'll kind of fold them in too, but at least we have that ability to at least refer out. Great. And then the final question um, from Shobi Chetta about uh, um, healthcare disparities in alcoholic liver disease and, and referral to transplant and, and treatment, et cetera. Um, and are we, what do we know about it? And what are we doing here to help um, combat uh, healthcare disparities? 
we know it exists. There's been lots of publications recently, one very recent that I just looked at that showed that um, Black Americans are less likely to be referred for transplant and maybe less likely to be seen in hepatology clinic. And I think we, you know, we hope that we're not doing that here, but it, that's just putting a wall, the wool over our eyes. We know that disparities are real and happening and we need to be aware of them. And I don't know the exact numbers here. Um, you know, the, we get referrals from all across the state. So it's not just Madison that we are, the Madison patients we are seeing. So we're seeing them all across uh, the state, but I, it's absolutely true that healthcare disparities exist and black Americans are just less likely to be um, referred for the, to the liver transplant clinic. And so um, one of the things that we're gonna try to do within this clinic is also um, Andrew Kwanbeck, who I, I've been working with a little bit and, and Michael Lucy and I have been working with him. He's working on a grant to try to use our clinic to do lots of other studies for. And that is one of the things that we would wanna focus on as well is trying to figure out are there disparities and what can we do about it? Great. All right, well, we are um, out of time. Uh, Rita, really a wonderful way to end the year. So thank you so much. Um, look forward to seeing the rollout of the clinic and hearing the results uh, and the impact of the work that you're doing. So thank you again and um, enjoy the summer break, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and drink responsibly. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.